principle of our Catholic faith is that our Catholic faith does not allow for grandfathering in. The way that Jesus has revealed God's kingdom to us, it cannot be grandfathered in. When we use that phrase, of course, we're saying that I get the benefits of what my grandfather did or my dad did. It really can't be inherited by mankind. We benefit from the merits of Jesus Christ. By his passion, death, and resurrection, we receive that grace, the grace of redemption, the grace of the opportunity to repent of our sins. But ultimately, our faith must be personal. It cannot be passive. I cannot take what my grandfather did well and apply it to myself. I come from a long line of Catholics. The Carvalhos have been Catholic because we've been Portuguese. But that doesn't mean that I'm a good Catholic. I must take ownership for my faith. I must respond to my vocation. I must choose Jesus Christ and call upon his name, the name by which every other person bows. At the name of Jesus, even the demons have to bow. Because by the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, that word means God saves us. That's powerful. It's exactly why in Advent we prepare our hearts to receive Jesus as he first comes as a little babe in that manger in Bethlehem. But we also anticipate the second coming of Christ, when he will come to judge the living and the dead, when he will come with his winnowing fan, as John the Baptist said today. See, some of us may not come from an agricultural background. I don't. I don't know what a winnowing fan is. But it was a fork in which the farmer would take all of the wheat that he had harvested, put it into his barn, and on a day in which the wind would blow, he would take his winnowing fan, kind of like a pitchfork, and he would throw the wheat up into the air. The chaff, the bad stuff, would blow away by the wind. But the wheat, which is heavy, would fall. This is exactly what Jesus will do, as John the Baptist promises, at the second coming. In the midst of our faith journey, there will be times when we will be thrown around so that the chaff will fall away and the wheat will remain. And God will gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff will go to everlasting fire. It's a beautiful metaphor for what we need to do in our own lives. By choosing Jesus Christ, there will be times when things will need to be purified from us. The chaff will, be have, to, will have to be burned off so that the wheat would remain. Just as in another parable, Jesus says that uh, the master who, has a, a, um, master who has his harvest, he allows the wheat and the weeds to grow up together so that at the end of time, at harvest time, the weeds will be separated from the wheat and the weeds will go to everlasting fire and the wheat will remain. Jesus uses these beautiful parables and these beautiful analogies to show us how we must be purified. By choosing Jesus Christ, we will be challenged. There will be difficulty. There will be tribulation. Jesus has promised us that. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So therefore, we want to yoke ourselves to Jesus Christ if we want to stand fast, if we want to persevere. This is exactly why St. Paul in the Romans tells the people, he tells the Romans, wait a second, whatever was written previously was written for, you, for our instruction to teach us that by endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope from the scriptures and be encouraged and endure, endure difficulties. We just had the passing of a diabolical law this last week. We have to endure. 
How will we endure? How will we stand fast? How can we keep encouraging one another? But by the scriptures. The scriptures are that bedrock, the words of God that give us strength, give us protection, that continue to nourish us even in the midst of difficulties and have been encouraging other Catholics for thousands of years. For some reason, we think that they won't help us now. That's crazy. But our choice, of course, as we said, is between a Catholic faith, a living out of my Catholic faith that is passive, that is only receptive, that is only lazy? Or do we have the personal relationship with Jesus where we know his promises, where we know what he has done for us, where we are encouraged by the teachings of the church, challenged to live a life of holiness in the midst of an unholy world, still being persecuted by the flesh or the devil or the world? Each one of us must make that choice because the scribes and the Pharisees, as John the Baptist encountered them today, they came to church. They went to the synagogue. They were doing the right things and saying the right prayers. But John the Baptist calls them a brood of vipers. A brood of vipers. Snakes eat each other. So do spiders. That's why we have to... They're just terrible creatures, but God created them so they're for a purpose. But the point is, is that if he's calling them the brood of vipers, those who were supposedly holy in everyone's eyes, he's saying, your faith has not taken root. He says, bear fruit from your repentance. He says that's how, and Jesus tells us, that's how they will know that we are his disciples, when we bear fruit, when we are truly acting in accord with our vocation, the calling God has given to you and given to me. And I have to say on a personal, personal way that I'm sorry that there have been priests who have not acted in accord with their vocation, that they have not lived their vocation fully, that they have not come to this pulpit and the pulpits around the world and proclaimed the personal living relationship that they have with Jesus Christ, but gave platitudes and talked about butterflies, banners, balloons, and rainbows. That's not encouragement. The encouragement is for a priest or a bishop to get up and proclaim the relationship that he has with Jesus Christ. And that what Jesus Christ has done for him and for you transforms this world. And I'm sorry that the insecurities and the terrible relationships that these priests have had have gone into the confessional, the most sacred and intimate moment with God's forgiveness and mercy, and they have abused that by abusing you, by chastising you, by making you walk out of that confessional crying more because you are abused in there than you are in the world. I'm sorry for that. And that's a reality in the church. And I'm sorry for that. But I promise you, I don't want to be that priest. I'm trying my hardest not to be that priest. I'm trying my hardest to live that Christ-like relationship, that Christ-filled relationship and Christ-life-like, like, like, Christ-like life. I thought I could play on words, but I didn't do it very well. Okay, great. But the Lord is working. Despite bad examples, despite the brood of vipers that we see within the world, wherever they are found, fathers, mothers, priests, bishops, whatever, the brood of vipers, big deal. Christ is bigger than that. He will come with spirit and with fire to encourage us to help us grow in holiness, to help us overcome obstacles in our life, whether it's psychological, physical, or spiritual. They are no match, no match to the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. And this is truly the spirit that Christ brings and that we hear enunciated by the prophet Isaiah. From his stem, from his shoot, 
that sprouts from the stump of Jesse, there will come a spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Those gifts of the Holy Spirit are true, and they were given to you at your confirmation, or for you little ones, when you are confirmed. Those will be solidified. They will be sealed. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. They will be ratified in your heart so that you can live that Spirit-filled life. But the challenge today is that I as a father, I as a mother, I as a wife, I as a husband, I as a priest, I as a bishop, I as the Pope, we must choose Jesus Christ and that means that we must live our life in accord with that. Because being a mother, a father, a husband, a wife, a priest, a bishop, a pope, a single person, that's not, not just an occupation where you can punch your ticket. I gave birth to these kids. My wife can, can figure it out. My husband can figure it out. I have become a priest, I've punched my ticket, I've run the race so as to win, they ordained me, now I can sit back and relax. No. He who is entrusted with much, much will be expected. Jesus promised that. So as a husband, if you are not attentive to your wife completely, or as a wife, if you're not attentive to your husband completely, we are failing. If as a wife and, and mother, as a husband, and a father, if you are not concerned with your kids, there's a problem. Big problem, by the way. Because if your occupation, the thing you do for a living, takes precedence over your children, you got big problems. Big problems. And if your kids are outside of the house, that means stretching yourself and contacting them loving on them, encouraging them with scripture, with your love, your example, saying I may not have been the best dad, I may have not been the best mom, but I want to make that up to you now. And I'm going to stretch myself, I'm going to hurt myself in reaching out to you, saying I haven't forgotten about you, I still love you, no matter where you are, what you've done, because I imitate God the Father in that way. I imitate our Blessed Mother, who never gave up on anybody, nor forsaken, forsook anybody, nor judged anybody. Now these are harsh realities, but these are why John the Baptist came. His vocation, the calling in his life, the purpose of his life was to prepare the way of the Lord. In the desert, he would proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, change your ways. Come back to Jesus, who is coming after me, of whose sandal I am not worthy to even carry or unstrap. Jesus comes so that we can be free, free to love one another. It's the whole reason why St. Paul reminds us. He says, welcome one another as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a minister of the circumcised to show God's truthfulness. And he says, to confirm the promises to the patriarchs, those who have come before us, so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Out of justice, God is willing to give us what is our due. But out of his mercy, he gives us what we're not worthy to receive. And that's what comes to us right here, right now in Holy Communion if we have prepared our heart, if we have been to confession, if we have nothing holding us back through sin and death in our life, we come to receive him. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under this roof, but only say the word and your, my soul, your servant, my soul will be healed. Because you promised it, not because of what I do, not because of what I have inherited, not because of what my father or grandfather or great-grandfather or any fathers before me did, but because I have said yes to you. I believe. And St. Paul tells us that to believe and to call the, out the name of Jesus, we will be saved. 
This is what the world will never tell you, will never promise you, no matter who the presidential candidate is, no matter who the governor is, no matter who your city council member is. It doesn't matter because their office is gonna change. But what never changes is the fact that God today wants to come into your heart and mine. He wants to transform your life and mine. He wants to come to you so that you will be a better father than yesterday, a better mother than yesterday. He wants to give you the grace, endurance, and encouragement from the scriptures. It's the whole reason why the church gives us the scriptures three times at Sunday Mass, two times at weekday Mass. Why? Because the discouragement, the complaining, the cynicism, the negativity, the despair from this world is overwhelming. But we have hope. We have encouragement. We have the truthfulness of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And so that means that you have the privilege of taking care of your kids. You have the privilege of spending time with them, little saints who are trying to be better and better each day, if they don't see your encouragement, if they don't see your love, if they don't see your presence, my God, something is wrong. And for us as priests and bishops, the responsibility is so much the greater because my love is not for one woman. It's for the church. My love is not for one child or three or 11 or 13. It's for all of humanity. The zeal for souls in my heart burns to consuming my life. That's how it's gotta be. Not how it should be, that's how it's gotta be. If Christ is to reign in the world, I have to prepare the way of Christ to you. I have to be John the Baptist to you. I have to remind you of what Jesus did and said and how much he loves you and how much he wills you to have a relationship with the Father, how much he wants the Holy Spirit to be part of your life, and how much he has suffered and died for love of me and for you, and that that changes this world. It changes my life. Now, it's easy for these things to be said. That's what this homily is all about. I can go through the motions. I can tell you all these things. But until I live it out, I'm not bearing the fruit that God wills for my life. I can touch souls. I can tickle your ears with nice platitudes. You can be encouraged because I stumble over my words just like you do, trying to stammer over the faith, trying to express God's realities and his, his beautiful mystery. I'm just like you, a son of God, a daughter of God. But I made that choice at my baptism. I didn't make it, but my parents made it for me, as your parents did for you. But at my confirmation, I stood there, and I was sealed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every time I come to Holy Communion, I pray, Lord, I'm not worthy. Make your gifts complete in me. Perfect me. Help me to grow in holiness. Encourage me by my prayer life, where I hear your voice. Each one of us has that opportunity to hear the voice of God, to be familiar with God. Just like the stranger, the telemarketer that calls you, and he says, hey, is this Bob? Yes, this is Bob. He says, Bob, I've got a great opportunity for you. What's your first, who is this? Who is, I don't know your voice. Who is this? Oh, it's Michael. Who's Michael? I don't know your voice. It's the whole reason why Jesus said, you, his sheep, will hear his voice and know that that is the good shepherd. In your prayer life, that's exactly what happens. The more we pray, the more familiar I am with Jesus' voice, and it's a lot louder and a lot more encouraging and a lot more loving than the voices I hear in this world. It's got to be, because this is discouraging. This is depressive. This is cynical, negative, and critical to the nth degree, and I'm sick and tired of it, and I'm sure you are too. But yet, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. Christ is coming. 
Christ is our rock and our refuge in, our, in the midst of our storms of life. He breaks through obstacles. He sets captives free. The blind, the deaf, the mute are no match because Christ will open their eyes, their ears, and their mouth to sing his praises, to hear his glory, to see his glory, to hear his wonderful voice. This is our life as Catholics. This is our vocation to proclaim to all nations that God is king he is the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords. He is Emmanuel with us, and we are not orphaned. We are truly set free. We are truly sons and daughters of a good, loving, and merciful God who hasn't given up on me or you. This is what this Advent is all about, and this is what John the Baptist comes today to tell us. It's prepare the way of the Lord. And when he comes, when he comes, John the Baptist will yell to you, just as he did to Andrew and John and all of the disciples of John the Baptist before him. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Look at him, etche. Behold him. See him. Follow him. This is the beautiful thing that we follow, is that Andrew and John, when they heard that voice of John the Baptist say, behold, follow him, this is the man I've been telling you about, they followed him, kind of sneakily, but they followed him. And Jesus turned around and said, what do you seek? They said, where are you staying, Lord? Where do you reside? Where can we be with you? What did Jesus respond? Come and see. Come and see. So that's what he's inviting you to do today. John the Baptist cries out, behold the Lamb of God. You come up to receive him. Do we have that curiosity, the curiosity of that personal relationship with Jesus to come to him and see what he has in store for us, see what he's willing to do for us, see how you and I can bear much fruit, fruit that will last. God bless you.